Hi, I'm Scott Jones. I'm director of the Electronic Frontiers Forums track at DragonCon. Thank you for joining us uh, today for virtual DragonCon 2020. This hour, our topic is the Earned Act, LATA, and other threats to encryption. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We actually have three attorneys and three technologists today. If we could start with uh, Dwayne, please introduce yourself and tell us about yourself. Yeah, hi, my name is Dwayne Gatesoul. I'm an intellectual property attorney in Austin, Texas, and i um, been doing this for close to 25 years now. Okay, Ron. I'm Ron Daniels. I'm a consumer rights lawyer down in middle Georgia. I do uh, a variety of consumer rights claims and also deal with some privacy claims and do a little bit of criminal defense. Okay, Kurt. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. EFF is a uh, nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to uh, defending your rights online. Uh, and we've been involved in the encryption wars since the, the, uh, the first crypto wars of the 90s, which we may talk about in a little bit. Uh, it's great to be back at DragonCon, though I must say I miss seeing you all in person. But uh, nevertheless, I'm glad to be able to participate virtually uh, once again. Okay, uh, Eric. Hi, my name is Eric Simmons. I'm an information security manager and AppSec lead at Aaron's Incorporated in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I've been doing uh, software for roughly uh, 20 years and doing uh, information security for the last five years. Okay, Tanya. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Scott mentioned, my name is Tanya Lamont. Um, I've been uh, in InfoSec for up to 10 years. Uh, I work as an IT manager at uh, the Big Four and uh, also a STEM advocate um, with the National Institute for Training Women in IT. And I'm looking forward to some great discussion. Okay, and okay. Rebecca. My name is Rebecca Carlson. I work in information security doing incident response. Okay, I, um, and we will uh, start with the uh, attorneys. I'd like to go back to the so-called crypto wars, which are uh, back in the 1990s, and we had the clipper chip back then. Uh, and we would like to talk about that. Kurt, if, could you start off and give us some background? Certainly. Kurt? We had to, uh, yeah, classic muting and unmuting on, on Zoom. Uh, crypto wars in the 90s. So uh, this was basically, uh, uh, for a while, encryption was considered to be a military technology. Uh, you know, uh, and it came from the military. A lot of uh, the uh, encryption systems that were robust at the time were military, though there was also commercial encryption. Uh, but uh, uh, as the 90s rolled around, uh, there started to be more uh, easily available encryption, things like uh, pretty good privacy, the uh, PGP uh, email protection program, uh, and encryption was becoming more in available to, to average consumers. Uh, and this led to the, the government uh, uh, being a little bit uh, afraid of it. Uh, and this came up in the context of exports, uh, at least originally, where uh, exporting technology with encryption was prohibited, uh, and for a brief moment, uh, there was uh, one of the original uh, uh, browsers, Netscape. Uh, this was what later became Firefox, that most of you probably know. It had two versions. It had an international version, and it had a domestic version. And the international version had extremely weak encryption, while the domestic version had what was at that time considered to be strong encryption. Uh, but uh, uh, this led to a, a court challenge a uh, professor, uh, or at that time, I guess a grad student, later a professor, uh, published a program, it was called Snuffle, and it was an open source, very simple encryption program. And this uh, uh, came up under our fire for being uh, an export because anyone could go to a website and download this encryption program. It led to a, a challenge uh, and uh, the court's determining that code is speech uh, and this would allow uh, and to publish that uh, uh, stronger encryption than otherwise the export controls wanted to allow. Uh, so that was sort of the one of the first parts of the, the crypto wars. And uh, eventually this made that there were only one version of encrypted uh, browsers, 
that uh, things like PGP were available domestically and internationally, and uh, for a while at least was a great victory for encryption. Okay, I want to move it into the uh, the Earned Act. The proposed Earned Act uh, would modify Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, uh, Ron, would you be able to explain the Section 230 for us to help bring us up to date? So essentially, Section 230 uh, states that a a platform that acts purely as a publisher is not creating the content; they're not posting it. Uh, when they're when they're when they're just publishing it, they're not a creator; they're just a provider. Yeah, if I could just uh, uh, expand on that. So it's it's an immunity uh, from liability in the form of saying that uh, the website would not be treated as a publisher of material that came from others. In other words, the soapbox is not liable for what the speaker has said, uh, and uh, with. with with this, which was part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, a bill that the main point of which was actually to try and make sure there wasn't any indecency on the internet. Turns out that was unconstitutional. Uh, this may uh, be probably no surprise to people, but the portion that uh, uh, created a protection for websites for the user-generated content is what led to sites that have user-generated content. Originally things like GeoCities, MySpace, nowadays Facebook, Google, Twitter, all of these sites rely upon Section 230 uh, in order to host the content that you post uh, on them. Okay. okay. One thing I'd like to add to that is it's not an unusual thing. Uh, you have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that kind of echoes the same kind of safe harbor for internet service providers with respect to liability from copyright infringement because they're simply the, the medium for it. So this principle isn't unique to the Communications Decency Act. Okay. Uh, Dwayne, would you like to uh, dive in on the uh, Earn It Act first and talk about um, what that is uh, proposed to change with Section 230? Yeah, I mean, it's at a very high level, it's basically requiring uh, tech companies to provide access to encryption, whether that's uh, encrypted devices at rest or encryption in transit. Um, and in essence, it's, it, doesn't, it's not, it doesn't go as far as uh, LATA does to, in essence, outlaw encryption, but it does say, in essence, to tech companies, thou shalt cooperate with us so that we can obtain access to encrypted data in whatever form. Okay, Kurt, would you like to add anything? Yeah, well, I think one thing which is kind of interesting about the Earn It Act is it's trying to be a bit clever about it. Uh, the word encryption does not appear in the Earn It Act and its proponents mention that frequently. Uh, instead, what it, what it uh, says is that there will be some best practices that will be come up with by a committee and then ultimately be up to the Attorney General Bill Barr to determine and we all know where this is going, right? This is, this is about encryption. Uh, and you know, this is something they've advocated for a long time, but it tries to like disguise that and saying, what we really need is just to have best practices for service providers and so they can earn, get it, earn it, the uh, 230 uh, protection. And this is also like an interesting thing because it's, it's getting pushed forward by the Department of Justice. And one of the things that 230 actually has no effect on, it has an exception to its, its protections for any violations of federal criminal law. So the Department of Justice itself is actually completely unaffected by 230. It does not stop them in any way from enforcing federal uh, uh, criminal laws. But it is the, the, the hammer that they can use on these companies because these companies depend on Section 230 every day in order to operate in order to provide the services that, that, that people use. And so like, okay, we want to get a backdoor encryption. What do we do? Well, why don't we say, if you don't give it to us, you lose this thing you depend on. Okay. And, and I think the thing that's really interesting or, or not necessarily interesting or problematic is the group that comes up with the best practices is very law enforcement heavy. Uh, it's almost entirely 
law enforcement who is coming up with what the best practices are. Uh, and there's really no sort of accountability built into the act about best practices. Uh, let's say in four years, you have a completely change of government. The best practices all of a sudden can change on a whim just because it's all executive agencies, essentially. Okay. So, I mean, from the commercial perspective, um, I mean, I'll have, I have a question, right? Um, so for a while, uh, the law and government has been really hammering companies to take responsibility for some of the uh, crimes that happen, right? The data breaches, whether they get fined or, and let's face it, um, encryption has been by and large the response, right, to that. Um, to thwart some of the uh, these breaches that have, that are happening. So, I mean, to ask companies to then, you know, hand over, you know, that those keys to the kingdom, if you will, um, for the primary way that they protect themselves against these other regulations. Um, how do you see that happening? Do you see that happening? Um, and what is the what would be the argument? to allow this. Well, at least <laughs> from my point of view, it's there, there isn't a particularly good argument that the problem with, with computer security, uh, to, to paraphrase uh, uh, Professor Matt Blaze, uh, is not that it's too strong. Uh, that uh, you know, we're, we're fighting a, a cybersecurity battle where uh, there are more problems to solve than secure uh, systems and something that engineers in an insecurity is a bad idea and doing it with this, with this hammer uh, is pretty dangerous. Um, I, I think also I wanted to clarify at least one, one thing uh, or just update on, on earn it is there was a amendment uh, in, the, in the committee process. Uh, the amendment doesn't solve its, its uh, problems, but the amendment was moving away uh, from the sort of reliance on this this committee uh, and Senator Leahy um, Says you shouldn't be holding companies liable for failure to provide Encryption, so okay seems interesting, but it doesn't do the job um, that uh, uh, I think that one of the things that it envisions is trying to say that something is encrypted while having scanning on the client side so, you know, for, for encryption to really work, it has to be a private message between people. And if you want to call something technically encrypted, but there is a program that is on the client side, decrypting the messages, looking at them, and then, you know, through AI reporting them elsewhere, this is defeating the point of, of encryption. So it's, again, trying to achieve this sort of spying on people result uh, without uh, you know, we're giving them an option of saying, well, technically it's encrypted. Uh, and we've also seen this with people saying that transport layers uh, encryption is encryption, it's good enough. And what we really need to have security is end-to-end -end encryption where the, the user holds the keys. And, and I think another thing that the, the amendment does, uh, and, and Kurt, you're probably more up on that than me, but it, it actually kind of shifts toward a state by state model in terms of, uh, of enforcement and trying to have each state say, oh, well, you can be subject to these lawsuits in the state of Georgia and these lawsuits in the state of Texas. And in Nebraska, you are not subject to those lawsuits. And, uh, you know, it just kind of creates that constant problem of having 50 different states with different laws on tech. Well, absolutely. And there's certainly, you know, first of all, one state could just, you know, go crazy on this and then that would affect every other state because there are no services of note that aren't available in all the states. Uh, and uh, as well, there are plenty of, of states that are all about uh, breaking encryption that have been very vocal about, uh, about this and they, you know, saying that it's necessary for their uh, uh, police power purposes, um, and I'm afraid of a, of a race to the bottom, basically. Yeah, and what's going to happen, 
but companies, if, if that does pass, they're going to go with whatever the most burdensome one is because they're not going to want to create 30 or 50 different schemes for this. They're going to go, which one is going to cover me nationwide? And so you have this outsized effect based on what state is going to be the most you know, strenuous to enforce this kind of in the same way that you know, privacy policies right now are driven worldwide by the GDPR in Europe. Even if you're not necessarily targeting customers or have customers in Europe, you're saying, well, okay, I don't want to have to do policy here and policy there. So let's just comply with that. So de facto, whoever's going to have the, the harshest standards, everyone is by nature going to comply with it. So, Carmen, to your point, um, and I do have this question, you mentioned end-to-end -end encryption um, is the key. And of course, I definitely agree with that. Um, how do you see the move to companies to increasingly go to the cloud service provider enabling this type of legislation, right? So where everything would reside with that Amazon or Microsoft? Yeah, well, it is interesting. I mean, there are, um, there's a lot of economic efficiencies with doing things in the cloud. Um, and AWS, uh, Amazon's uh, cloud service, holds a lot of people's data. Like it is a very popular service for, for doing this. Um, and I think there are ways of doing that that are uh, encrypted and the user holding the, uh, the key. Um, I know that, uh, uh, you know, you may have to engineer that yourself with Amazon. I don't know if Amazon provides a in the box solution. I might be one of the technologists here can talk a bit more about that. Uh, it's my understanding that Microsoft has Azure as a service where the customer holds the key. But uh, uh, in order to sort of replicate the protections that you would have as either a, an individual using a cloud service uh, where you're getting it yourself or more likely a, a business who wants to use it and be secure, to have that kind of level of, of protection, you got to hold the key and use it with a cloud service. Okay, I want to move on to um, Leda. Uh, Kurt, could you uh, tell us, spell us, out, spell it out, tell us uh, what it stands for and what the proposal is? As I understand, this one is not tied to Section 230. Oh yeah, this is like so. Section 230 and the earn it thing, you know, is a, a way of trying to be a little bit clever about um, getting to the end result of having a backdoors. But Leda is just like straight at it, like. Uh, it is the law enforcement, sorry, the sorry, lawful access to encrypted data act. Uh, it's from uh, uh, Senators Graham, Cotton, and uh, Blackburn, I believe. Um, and you know, it's it's uh, just straight up trying to get access to your uh, encrypted emails. And uh, you know, one one might think uh, like perhaps the strategy there is actually to have this be the the bad guy, you know, good cop, bad cop kind of way before Congress is we have earn it here, which has all these other provisions trying to be you know, reasonable, even though uh, advocacy groups disagree that it's reasonable. And then you have Leda, which is this extremely like just have a backdoor uh, bill. Okay, uh, Dwayne or Ron, would you like to add anything? I mean, I think it's, Kurt's exactly right. I mean, this is an example of government going nuclear. Um, and the government is not tremendously great at nuance. And here, there's no pretense of nuance. There's no pretense of, you know, there's a specific problem that we're trying to solve, and we're going to narrowly tailor a solution to try to solve that. It's just drop the big one, destroy, you know, everything, and we'll maybe clean it up later, but not really. And I, I, I agree. I think the best way to describe it is the nuclear option. I, I almost think about it the way Kurt was talking about it, you know, just try to make it so bad that folks say, oh, well, the earn it isn't so bad. Uh, you know, it's kind of like giving somebody a plate of asparagus and putting uh, pudding on another plate. Uh, it may be very horrible tasting pudding, but uh, most of the time they're going to pick the pudding over the, the asparagus because they got those two options. Um, but it's, you know, nuance is not something the federal government does. Nuance 
uh, is let's drive a Mack truck through a tiny pinhole when you're the federal government. So would you say this um, legislation uh, empowers, so there was some recent legislation passed to allow ISPs to sell um, data, um, tra um, consumer data about their traffic, um, I guess to the highest bidder. So how would this legislation further either enable that or, or prevent that? Well, I would say that, that uh, what they're trying to actually get at here is uh, law enforcement access, right? So at least for, on, on, a, on its face, it is uh, saying you, know, you have to have these, these backdoors for law enforcement access. Uh, and that's sort of envisioning that they come with some legal process, might be a subpoena, might be a warrant, might be a uh, foreign intelligence surveillance uh, order. Uh, but to get to, your, to your, your point, which I think is an interesting one, is that how does this have an effect on the consumer privacy debate? Well, one aspect about having end and encryption is it's harder for companies to glean your data from that, like do AI analysis, try and determine what you like and don't like, sell you things based on that. These kinds of, of practices that, that many people are worried about having corporations data mine their communication streams. And you know, a lot of companies are saying, well, we don't do that or we do it in different ways, uh, but this is, this is a live concern. And if you have actually strong end-to-end -end encryption, then that's not something that the company can do because it doesn't have the key. But if they build a system that always gives them the ability to access, then if they ever wanted to access for the purposes of getting this information for their own commercial use or for sale, uh, they have the key available. So what it does is it weakens a technical defense that people may have uh, where their legal defenses to having their data sold or you know, having to give consent, all those things we see from the GDPR, for example, uh, if those don't hold up, it's good to have a technical defense. Okay. I think well, another probably potential problem for the consumer marketplace with it is the, the act itself, it has this decryption directive, but it doesn't say how to deal with it. And so you're going to see companies say, well, we have to provide a means for the government or law enforcement to access this, uh, but they haven't told us what that is. Uh, and it's almost the reverse problem that you would think, you know, oh, the government's telling us you have to have this type of access to it. Well, it's the, the converse. You're going to have everybody coming up with different systems, and then you're going to have people attacking those systems. And what's going to wind up happening is a door is a door is a door. Uh, right. You know, it, if you it, don't, it doesn't matter if it's the cops at the door or it's, you know, your neighbor down the street, uh, a door is a door and you can go through a door. If you recall, the Chinese were inside the OPM for over a year before they caught it. So <laughs> that's not too comfortable. So, so I have a question that kind of deals more with, you know, how do you balance? You know, so you've got this whole dynamic between the, the need for security and need for convenience. In the case of convenience, it's this idea that we need access to be able to perform a certain action, right? How do you balance the, the legitimate need to access information? Let's say like in the case of the, of the, uh, the terrorist incident that happened down in Orlando, Florida and with, when Apple got involved, how do, you, how do you come up with a legal construct that allows you to balance that, that, that dynamic in such a way that you can get the legitimate access that you need, but you don't compromise privacy and, and security? Well, I think uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and I think that is one of the, the challenges here. Uh, is that, you know, this is what a law enforcement is, is trying to say, is that we just want to have access under the law. And we, uh, as one was saying, uh, we leave it up to you to how to solve that, right? The law is just requiring you to somehow give us the access to the information we need. You figure out how. Uh, the, the challenge is, though, that uh, to be able to do that in a secure manner, one that doesn't unduly uh, create security problems and privacy problems for millions and millions of users because the, the system is broken, uh, you know, 
that, that's that's how it's going to happen if there will be a backdoor. So these, like lots of computer security experts are, are are saying that. And as a societal trade-off, uh, the ability to always be able to get every piece of information uh, versus breaking the security for millions or billions around the world of people is not a good trade-off. And I know this is this is something that law enforcement is not happy with. Um, and you know, you talk about the you know, Orlando incident. You know, there's the San Bernardino incident. There have been a number of circumstances in which the government has wanted to have access to material that was under encryption. Uh, I believe uh, uh, the uh, there was a report that came out of uh, there were a couple thousand incidents where you know they were having some trouble uh, getting into encrypted material. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's a, it's it's a good trade off. Uh, and I would say, like you know, in the past, we had things like uh, payphones, where if you didn't already have a wiretap up on that, the communication that happened on that payphone was gone after it was sent. There was no way to get that recording. If people met in person, even today, probably will have conversations that are unrecorded. We live actually in a golden age of surveillance. You know, with the phone. Uh, putting aside getting access to the encrypted communications. They got location data from cell phone towers to place where people are. Uh, most encryption systems, the, the ones that are, are popular uh, with, with consumers, you still have metadata leaking out information so they know who called who and can develop networks. So the law enforcement has so much more power to investigate right now than it has basically at any other point in history. Uh, and so I think that now, you know, despite their claims of always, you know, saying we're going dark, they have to recognize that actually they have more power and more invasive uh, powers than they've ever had. And with all these things can successfully conduct investigations. And in most of the instances that I've seen where they've talked about some encryption prevented them from getting a piece of data, they nevertheless were either they were able to successfully prosecute someone, or in some cases, the person that they're investigating was dead because they were killed in the, the event, like in the San Bernardino case, um, and I think also with the Pulse uh, uh, attack. Uh, and so, okay, so we wanna find out what was going on and, and why it's a useful piece of thing to find out, but there's no prosecution that's gonna come from someone who's already so, so do you feel that they, with all of the metadata that they're currently able to have access, that they truly have enough evidence to have actually move forward? Let's say that the, that the, the, the uh, perpetrator is still alive and they're going to go through prosecution. Do they have enough information to bring a, a viable case? Or is there a need for more specific information? Because you get into situations where, you know, you have uh, evidence issues about whether something's admissible or not to be able to prove your case. How, how do they... And, and I know it's a very it's a very hard thing. It's a challenge that's very hard to deal with because you're, you're you're trying to you're trying to balance the need of the greater good of security as it relates to public safety, right? So that, it's a huge it's a huge thing to try to manage. But do they truly have enough information to be able to bring a prosecutable case and and win that case? Well, I, I, I also good good question. And I I would say like you'd have to look at particular cases. Um, I, I mean, you know, looking at the 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 bigger picture. Uh, I think the trade-off is not a good one. Um, yeah. And in fact, it's not even really a, it, it's a weird trade-off because, um, for example, having your phone encrypted enhances security that if someone steals your phone, it is not very useful to them because they can't open it up and, you know, sell it to somebody else because it is encrypted with your information and your password. It's a brick to them, basically. And cell phone thefts have gone down since Routine, they were routinely encrypted. Mm -hmm. um, that you know used to be a problem if you were sitting in a cafe in a busy city and you were working on your laptop. Somebody might just run in there, snatch the laptop, and run out. Now this may still happen, but it's less. So there actually are security benefits, like real-world security benefits, to people by having uh, encryption. Um, and so yeah, you know, of course we don't want any you know uh, uh, a you know a, a society in which crime runs rampant. Un undetectable. But I would also you know, note that like, that doesn't mean we have no limits on the police power. Like, and 
For example, I think most people would be offended if they used readily available technologies to have it. So your car noted what the speed limit was, how fast you were going, and automatically sent that information to the police whenever you exceeded the speed limit. But without that technology, there are people violating the law every day. Right now, there's probably thousands of people in, in my, uh, in, here in the San Francisco Bay Area who are violating that law without getting caught because we don't have that technology. People say, okay, but, yeah, but that, that's too much of an infringement. On, on I don't know how many of us have probably gone uh, five or six miles over the speed limit, you know, uh, driving anywhere, right? So <laughs> that's, that's just a normal, I, I agree. And I, and I definitely, I definitely appreciate the, the answer. I, I uh, you know, sometimes I wonder if there were different encryption schemes that we could use, like a multi-part computational encryption scheme, where there were multiple parties that had to provide access to that key. So then you get more I guess more um, kind of discretionary access, right? Um, you wouldn't be able to just have a backdoor. Maybe there would be multiple people that had to kind of um, uh, kind of agree to allow that access. But it's definitely a, a, a hard challenge, and and I appreciate it. But I think it's it's important to note from my perspective, uh, doing some criminal defense work. You know, since 1789, when we had the Constitution that probably the most litigated in my realm of criminal defense part of the constitution is the fourth amendment. Uh, that's the prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, and there's just this necessary tension um, between what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. And, you know, it, we, we could talk for 10 years, uh, the folks here on this panel, and we wouldn't be able to come up with a hard line answer because we ain't been able to do it since 1789. I mean, it's always evolving, like and always changing. Yeah, there, there isn't a, an answer, I don't think. I don't think there is going to be a hard line answer. Um, one of the things that, that occurs to me, 2018, we saw the passage of SESTA-FOSTA, which was another attack on Section 230. Um, and we saw hosting providers um, like Twitter and Tumblr and Instagram pretty much fall all over themselves to remove any kind of content they thought could be in conflict with SESTA FOSTA, ban users, shadow ban users. What do you think will be the impact if um, Earn It is passed? And what do you think the actions of hosting providers will be in order to get those best practices? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, SESTA FOSTA uh, was also using the same sort of strategy of threatening the protections of 230 you know, the, the, uh, the protections that have brought the internet to life over the last couple of decades, but people like, okay, now we got it. How can we use this? Uh, and uh, I would be very concerned if, if, uh, if, if earn it uh, uh, were to pass that uh, it would cause not only the, the companies to be sort of forced into doing something I wouldn't like about encryption, but they would also perhaps get under tremendous pressure to uh, to err on the side of even more law enforcement access, to like not be caught out on the wrong side of things. And I think that's what happened with SESTA FOSTA. There were a number of things that were taken down were clearly not the sort of things that they had talked about, at least when passing the law, but because the way the law was defined, because of, you know, uh, a sort of broad sweep of it, Technically, they could be within the law, and if you were not within the law, that was really, really bad, and so people get uh, uh, get very nervous, and um, that's that's definitely a concern. Yeah, I mean, I think the companies have to get in line and go along with it because they're in the business to make money, which means they're by definition risk averse, and we lawyers are extraordinarily expensive, and you know, no one wants to put our kids through college to take that all the way through and, and you know, bankrupt a company or whatever. So it, it's an easier thing to do to kind of jettison the beliefs or you know, what's right in order to get behind law enforcement and do it, even though you know, I'm sure they know, okay, this isn't technically right, but it's something we have to do if we want to have a business tomorrow. So when you bring up a good point, this isn't the first. So um, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but um, Amazon, as well as IBM, have pulled out of the face recognition, facial recognition software for police 
um, just due to, you know, the number of false IDs made. So not the first time that technology has that double-edged sword where law enforcement's concerned in the use of it, so. Yeah, absolutely right. And the thing, you know, with everything that's going on in society today, uh, we need more encryption. You know, we need more people that are able to send secure messages for any number of different reasons, whether it's, you know, marginalized communities or people of color who want to protest, whatever the case might be. Now is not the time to get rid of encryption when, and I, I, I view this whole thing kind of on a, a balance of the equities sort of thing. That yes, if, if law enforcement had access to everything encrypted, sure, some bad things might be prevented. On the other hand, how many billions of encrypted messages and secured transactions go on IP. every single day, right? So I weigh those two out and go, you've got billions upon billions of lawful, secure transactions going on that protect people, that prevent financial theft and that kind of thing, versus a small handful of terrible things that might happen. To me, I balance those out and go, I hate for the bad things to happen. But on the other hand, I think the equities weigh in favor of you know, 99% of the rest of the world. Oh, yeah. Well, I think Ronald, he put it very succinctly when he said that there's a necessary tension, right? I think that the tension is absolutely necessary. We shouldn't remediate or get rid of the tension. The tension is a necessary uh, part to kind of keep things in balance. Um, so I, I definitely like that. I think that's a very succinct way of putting it. Okay. Um, let me put forth the fo uh, following premise. Uh, you can agree or disagree, uh, discuss or debate. Uh, I'll start with a statement. A backdoor for one is a backdoor for all. And I'll put forth the notion that the essential nature of digital technology is that it's nearly all open or all closed. We have no techni technical solution today to tell the good guys from the bad guys 100% of the time. Uh, and I suspect this problem is not solvable in my lifetime and that any claims to the contrary are snake oil or somebody trying to sell you something. Um, so I, this is, you know, I, I mean, I'll put this forth as a premise and, and something that may be difficult to sell to Congress or to the general public. Uh, and I'll open this up to anyone. Would anybody like to comment on this? I mean, I agree. You can't be a little bit pregnant, right? So... A door is a door, um, and it can be used for good or it can be used for bad, but you can't, you can't close off all access and still be able to, to get into the house. Well, it, it goes back to the whole, the balance of security and convenience, right? If you, you apply too much security, you become so inconvenient, you become un unusable. If you apply too much uh, convenience, then you become in insecure. So you have to maintain that, that balance. I, and I agree, if there's, there's a back door for one, it's a back door for all. Yeah. I have a stronger view. I, I think it's probably the beginning of the end, you know, if this if this really pulls through. I think it's a threat to capitalism. Um, there's just so much uh, that is hinged on being secret. When we talk about the success of companies, intellectual property, um, just millions and billions of dollars at stake. And in addition to that, this is the time to vote. And what more tension <laughs> is, you know, brewing in this country than, hey, are we going to get hacked again? Um, you know, like we were four years ago. So um, I, I think this is a bad time to bring this up. We, we need to be talking about how to strengthen uh, security, information security. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I think one of the challenges in explaining this to lay people as well who are not involved with conversations about encryption um, is, you know, how do you make people understand the actual importance of it? Because it's kind of, um, it's kind of a remote concept for a lot of people. You know, the law enforcement should be able to look at messages to, you know, find uh, like child sex trafficking online, things like that. Um, and I think you have to make this, in a lot of ways, you have to make this a personal, um, uh, make this a personal thing to them to make them understand the actual importance of encryption. It, it's not just if your cell phone is stolen, um, you know, your connection to your, your banking application on your phone is encrypted. Your, you know, 
if you are a domestic violence survivor, your communication with a, a shelter worker who's helping you get out of the situation needs to be encrypted. That is, you know, of immediate personal safety to you. And I, I think a lot of people don't understand, you know, just how closely encryption touches them until it, it comes home. Well, well, Rebecca, I think one way you can kind of explain it to them is, you know, would you ever leave your door unlocked all the time? No, it's a trust issue. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it, it boils down to what are you willing to trust? And uh, politicians obviously don't trust uh, everybody in society to just leave their doors open. They have personal safety guards to keep themselves safe. So they don't trust that, that they walk into a into a crowded uh, environment there, that their personal safety is going to be there. So they obviously have trust issues. And if you explain it to them in that way, that security provides somewhat of a, uh, or immigration provides somewhat of this zero trust uh, mentality and put it in context of, you know, imagine yourself in a situation where, you know, you're, you're going to have to trust that this person is going to use your information reasonably and not to harm you. They would never go for that. Right. So that's, I think that's really the key thing is put it in a, in a sense that, Every day you lock your door. Why? Because you don't trust that the individuals have your best interest. Every individual has your best interest at heart. You know, I, 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 uh, I have some hope that, that people in, in Congress and government are starting to use encrypted systems more and more frequently and may start to understand their, their value. I mean, they should. There have been a lot of scandals been generated because someone's email got hacked and then, you know, it, it became, you know, leaked out there and they should see that like having strong security. Now, most of those cases, it wasn't breaking the encryption, it was uh, phishing for the password, but nevertheless, hopefully this will give people an idea of why security uh, is, is important. Uh, for, for, for Scott's question, one of the things you're saying like there, there is uh, you know, no way to determine who's good and who's bad. And I think you're, you're, you're right, uh, though this reminded me of, of a, uh, uh, one of the RFCs from the uh, long time ago uh, on the, uh, the internet uh, for April Fool's Day, RFC uh, 3514, the evil bit. And it proposed a new standard for uh, internet uh, communications that you would add a bit to all your traffic to say whether or not you had malicious intent. And that would make the, uh, the job of the firewalls and uh, all that super easy. You could detect whether or not you had the evil bit and okay. block the traffic uh, accordingly. And it was just a, a really sort of nice uh, uh, send up on just sort of the complete impossibility of actually doing this task, uh, which is basically what firewalls are often charged with doing is figuring out whether this is a, a malicious packet or not. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the problem is that people just don't set the evil bit. Hey, maybe, maybe what we can do in the quantum computing world, Kurt, is utilize qubits and we can kind of be in between both, you know, I'm sort of bad, I'm sort of good, right? That's right. Uh, there was a story recently about uh, some, some uh, uh, discussing quantum computing, quantum encryption, and, and qubits, and it quoted some people saying, "And this may, you know, uh, make these things impossible to hack." And you know, like the problems with, with getting into communications. Okay, maybe you can't get in through brute force because it'll take too many computers to do that. But then you know you've got your phishing. You got somebody. You can get somebody's password. There are a million other ways of hacking to get at things and you can have all the qubits you want and those methods will still happen. And, and I'd like to touch on Rebecca's question real quick. Yeah, you know, I, I think part of what I have to do every day in a profession sometimes is explain really complex stuff in really simple terms. Um, and I try to think about trying to explain encryption to a jury of 12 and I just don't uh, you know, there's no way you can throw around the word encryption and they're going to get it. Um, but what I have relied on a lot of times in some of my cases, particularly where privacy is involved or say somebody's got a mixed credit file with Experian or something like that, uh, is uh, growing up in South Georgia, we didn't have a drying machine. We had a clothesline uh, and the clothesline throughout the town is invariably in everybody's backyard. You don't put your clothesline in the front yard with your undergrews hanging out for everybody to see. <laughs> and everybody seems to be able to understand that concept that you don't want a clothesline in your front yard with your underwear on it. And it's the same concept is you don't want everything to be out and open for everybody to see unless that's just how you are. But very few people are going to be 
I, yeah, I want it to be that kick wide open. I want, you know, John Q. Law to be able to see what I'm hanging on my clothesline. And I want my neighbor to see, and I want the mayor to see, and everybody else see. It's just most people can get it when you break it down to the simple building blocks of the concepts. Uh, and, you know, it trivializes it a little bit, and we can laugh about it, but that's what it takes for some people to understand. Okay. Well, I have to jump in here. We're actually at 45 minutes, so we need to go ahead and start wrapping up. Um, uh, Dwayne, do you have any final thoughts at this point? Um, not really. I mean, I think it's been a great conversation, very uh, enlightening, and I appreciate everyone's comments uh, towards what is a very, a very difficult issue. And I think you said it earlier, Scott, that if someone promises a simple solution to something like this, they're selling snake oil. Kurt? Uh, yeah, so a couple of thoughts. So one is, hey, everybody at DragonCon, we're coming from the past. So we actually don't know what happened over the last, uh, uh, you know, a little bit uh, uh, in encryption and legislation. But find out what's happening right now. Go, you can go to EFF.org to find out. Go to act.EFF.org if you want to take action, because it may be really important for you to contact your representatives and talk to them about how the earn it bill or any encryption bill is a bad idea and they should wait before going down that road and hear from their constituents. So I urge you all to take action. First step being find out what's been going on since we recorded this session. Okay, Ron. And I'm just going to piggyback off Kurt there and say that if you're not following and liking uh, EFF on social media, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, a lot of times you will see the kind of call to action. Hey, contact your legislature, whether it's your state legislator or your, your congressman or your senator uh, on those mediums. And it might be something that may not have been on your radar, but sort of out there on the outside of it. And then all of a sudden you, you realize there's an important issue that you do need to voice your opinion about. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything, but I, I definitely have learned a lot. And I'm going to definitely go to the EFF.org and start looking at it. I, I think that's that's great. It's great that you're doing that, Kurt. Okay, Tanya. Uh, same here, Scott and everybody. Thank you so much for an explosive panel, you know, just bringing new perspective to the issues. And I'll definitely be following and uh, letting my voice where I can. Okay, and finally, Rebecca. Um, I think it's been a great discussion. I think we could probably go on for hours more because there's so much to unpack with this particular issue. Um, obviously, I think we should all keep a very close eye on not only this, but what comes next. Okay. All right. And I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. And uh, we'd like to say, everyone, thanks for uh, tuning in. And Enjoy the rest of your Dragon Con, uh, Virtual Dragon Con 2020. Thank you very much. Thanks, God. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.